other countries, um, they are unbanked. They have hyperinflation. They have corrupt governments. They're more likely to utilize Bitcoin to substitute their existing medium of exchanges. And so I think that it really depends on the home base. Um, ultimately, I'm a U.S. investor, U.S.-based investor. I view it as a store of value. But I think that even if I don't utilize it as a medium of exchange, the ability to do so increases its value. You don't have to, but you can. And, and it's just this very flexible asset where um, its use case is really determined by the end user. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. This week, I have on Joe Orsini. Joe, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Great to be here. Yeah, of course. Glad to have you. Um, I'm curious, what was your career background before working in the Bitcoin space? Sure. So, you know, um, like many others, I'm actually a traditional finance guy. So, you know, right out of school, I worked for a mid-sized investment bank in the city um, and I was in their asset management division and I worked on the investment strategy team, which was directly alongside the chief investment strategist of the firm. Uh, so I contributed to weekly, quarterly, monthly, annual investment commentary, as well as managed a, a variety of portfolios um, from inception to, you know, about 500 million in total. And so ultimately, um, you know, I come from that traditional finance background, uh, which I think is interesting because it kind of gives me a, a slightly different perspective on things and perspective on kind of how Bitcoin's moving and, and why it's moving in the direction that it is. But ultimately now I'm in the deep down the rabbit hole and deep into the crypto space and uh, couldn't be more happy with it. Yeah, awesome. I think that's a great background. I'm curious, like what caught your attention working in traditional finance? Like, how did you become interested in, in something like Bitcoin? Sure. So I, I found out about Bitcoin at the same period, I believe, you know, many did. And, and it was the parabolic advance to 20,000 in late 2017. And I remember sitting at my desk and ultimately getting CNBC notifications on my phone saying uh, Bitcoin is 15,000. You know, 10 minutes later, Bitcoin was 16,000. Another notification, 17,000. I was like looking left and right. I'm like, really, what is this asset? And not many people understood it or knew about it at the time, similar to me. And so, of course, that kind of uh, kind of caught my interest at, at the beginning. Um, like many others, I started participating early in 2018 um, and really started to buy Bitcoin 2018, 2019 and ultimately 2020. Um, you know, we, you know, we can discuss the kind of thesis there, but ultimately, the more I learned about it, the more, um, you know, I felt comfortable with owning it and the more I kind of wanted to accumulate uh, and, and essentially become, you know, kind of an analyst in the situation that I'm in now. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, thinking about when you were working in traditional finance and and you saw the Bitcoin, you know, going parabolic the first time to 20,000. What were like your peers saying at the time? Like, were they interested at all? Were they like, this is obviously some sort of bubble or Ponzi or what were their general thoughts or were you guys even talking about it? Yeah. So I feel like it was one of those exciting moments where you kind of look left and you look right and, and, and everyone apparently is making money. There's always that guy that kind of had Bitcoin. He's all happy during that period. And so it was kind of one of those exciting things. And you're kind of seeing the gamification that's occurring just all across kind of traditional finance, traditional equities and options and everything like that. So, um, you know, people viewed it as an opportunity. And what was so interesting at that time is because it was there was so much polarization uh, between the bulls and bears because you had so many bulls bracket investment banks um, kind of come out at that period and say it is a bubble. Uh, we don't understand this. Bitcoin's a scam. If you remember, um, ultimately, some advertising companies, almost every advertising company stopped even advertising crypto on their on their platform. And, and really what a long way we've come uh, since then. But I think really and similar to the adoption story now is that people are intrigued by, you know, by volatility. <laughs> And it's just, it is what it is, especially the younger generation. And so that certainly, uh, you know, kind of catches a lot of the interest of people. And similar to what we're seeing now is you had the rally to 67,000 in 2021. Uh, that captured a lot of interest as well. So, Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree that Bitcoin's volatility is something that catches a lot of people's attention and sometimes intrigues people and then also sometimes scares people away from it. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely great points there. Um, Let's talk more from like a macro perspective and then we'll get into like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum too, um, or at least your thoughts on that. Uh, from a macro perspective, you know, we've started to see CPI slowing. We saw the first month over month negative number. What, what are your thoughts on, on consumer prices? Yeah, so if you kind of look back at really how it all began, um, of course, we had unprecedented monetary policy in 2020. 
Um, and then you kind of had a, you know, a blue wave what occurred in that 2020 election. And so, of course, at that period, uh, people started to believe inflation was coming and, and yields went higher. Uh, inflation, of course, went higher. Commodities went higher. Anything kind of inflation sensitive at that time uh, started to rally in late 2020 and, and really throughout 2021 as well. And so but ultimately what you saw was you had COVID, you had some supply chain problems. And of course, you had the Russia-Ukraine war. And really, it started to lead to, you know, this supply side uh, inflation problem that that was first believed to be transitory. And I think the Fed was kind of correct in that regard, because, you know, you had a decade of ZERP, and it did not lead to any price inflation whatsoever. And all of a sudden, now you did have some. So I think it was fair early on to believe that it was transitory. Uh, I think the Russian Ukraine war certainly kind of pushed back the disinflation that we're seeing, and it kind of kept inflation higher at that period, uh, certainly within the commodity spectrum. But one of the things I was talking about through all 2022 was essentially is that, you know, you had break evens moving lower. You had commodities peak in June. Uh, you had some surveys kind of start to slow in the second half of the year in terms of inflation expectations. And so ultimately, it really was only a matter of time. Of course, uh, you know, inflation did peak in June on both the month over month and the year over year number. And it went lower and lower since then with a big scare in October. If you remember, um, it was September CPI report. Uh, ultimately, it, it, it came off like the Fed has not made any progress at all. Uh, equities kind of were down big that day and then, and then they reversed. And all of a sudden it was kind of that uh, that potential equity bottom. And what we're seeing now is is likely that equity bottom. And so, um, you know, I kind of saw it and I said, you know, it's only a matter of time until inflation does come down. And now we're starting to see that. And so the key really is, of course, is 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 there going to be disinflation or deflation deflation being uh, a large a large risk for the Fed. And we'll see how they kind of um, go about that process of normalization going forward. The Fed wants to kind of go, uh, you know, into the mid fives, uh, the, the bond market, for example, it doesn't believe they're going to get past 5%. And so it's an interesting kind of dynamic right now. And ultimately, uh, data is going to illustrate and probably uh, kind of have the Fed uh, go where they want to go. And so uh, I think certainly a good sign to see that first month over month negative number. Uh, just hope that it's not too much deflation, right? Because deflation is not necessarily good either. Yeah, I definitely think that makes a lot of sense. That was for some very interesting points. I guess you said like data is going to be kind of what's, you know, telling the future and it's going to like give the Fed like the, I guess, the resources to like make their next move or next moves. Um, like how much more like data do we need for the Fed to like really lay off, lay off? Like if we, ha we have this one month over month negative number, if there are like two or three consecutive more like crazy negative month over month numbers, is that going to be enough to like really scare the Fed or like w what's going to need to change? And like over how long of a time period does does things need to change or does data need to come out for the Fed to really make a big decision? Yeah, so we'll see really the trajectory of, of inflation. And, and if you kind of look at the last three uh, or even six month over month numbers and you kind of take that average and then you annualize it, uh, particularly in the last three months, I mean, that's below 2%. And so the pace that inflation actually is going at this moment, despite the year over year numbers, um, it, it is sub 2%. And so the Fed is going to like that. Um, they're not going to act. They're not going to act quickly on it. Uh, there's this average inflation targeting. And so we were below 2% for so long. Now we're above 2%. Um, you know, not many really understand what that average period is. And I think that's kind of um, in, in, in flux, essentially. But ultimately, um, you'd like to see inflation kind of remain, um, remain muted, essentially, and the continued resilience of the economy. Now, uh, many believe that the economy can just collapse, that the Fed often hikes into a collapse. Uh, but the labor market remains strong. Uh, things are slowing, which which in what the Fed is doing, it's kind of showing that the Fed is actually having success, right? Because if the, if the economy was rolling, right, that often leads to further inflation. And so, you know, uh, economy is doing fine. Uh, the labor market has remained strong. Uh, S&P 500 earnings are doing pretty well. And so ultimately, um, it, it, it'll see. And so, you know, I think the Fed um, will likely want to hold as long as they can. And with the economy remaining resilient, they're going to be able to. Um, and so if the economy starts to collapse, you'll probably see the Fed start to cut. And in that regard, it might not be the best case scenario. So you kind of want to see the Fed be able to stay around this 5% that the bond market's pricing in um, and have the economy kind of continue to chug along like the way it is. And that seems kind of like, you know, the kind of mix that the Fed really wants. And, and really, even the market's probably looking for it, just doesn't realize it yet. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
You also, I saw you posted this really interesting chart on Twitter, maybe like a few weeks ago. And it was basically the high yield, like average for bond index, uh, like the average uh, yield on a high yield credit. Um, and you could clearly see the peaks of the of the yield were like almost very in line with previous Bitcoin bottoms. It was like 2015, 2016. And then we had like the 20, uh, late 2018, 2019. Then we had March 2020. And then potentially where we are now, like end of, you know, bottom at the end of 2022. Why do you think that's the case? And was that just a coincidence? Or what are your thoughts on, you know, Bitcoin and high, high yield credit? Yeah, so, um, you know, Bitcoin is this emerging asset. It's, it's speculative. It's still in the process of price discovery. And, and it's really a risk asset. And so, um, while in the future it could trade more defensive, maybe like a gold plus in the future down the line, right now it's a risk asset. And so um, it trades like so. And as you saw when volatility rose throughout 2022, uh, correlations kind of went to one. But ultimately, you know, a speculative asset doesn't necessarily like economic stress. And what this high yield kind of often illustrate is that economic stress and that credit stress, essentially. And so in periods where, you know, high yield OAS is kind of moving higher, the high yield spreads are moving higher. That's a period in which market participants are are more cautious or maybe fearing further downside and things like that. So, of course, Bitcoin is going to come down. But when you often see kind of these macro inflection points across not only credit, but equities as well, they're often very systematic, very uh, close to the same days that they occur, um, when high yield starts to peak and, and spreads start to compress again, I mean, that shows uh, that the economy is doing fine. And there really isn't that great concern with the credit market and, and the high yield market. And so that is a signal to some traders and, and, and of course, the algorithms that are in the space um, naturally uh, that, that things may all not be that bad. And of course, in that environment, you kind of want to start buying those risk assets that are further out in the curve. And so, of course, kind of when you look back at Bitcoin's bottoms, it ironically does happen to have uh, be at those turning points of, of the high yield spreads as well. Yeah, no, it was a very interesting card that I thought was like very insightful. And I also, have, I've looked in the past, like if you look at NASDAQ bottoms, it's kind of a similar thing. And also, like, I guess if you look at the VIX as well, VIX spikes kind of correlate with Bitcoin bottoms. If you had to like pick one of those metrics or maybe another like macro kind of metric that, to correlate Bitcoin bottoms with, which one would you pick or which one do you think would have like the most uh, like effective result of trying to like show, OK, hey, Bitcoin is probably bottoming here. Yeah, so I think it's going to kind of depend on is it a macro pullback? And that's kind of what we saw, at least in Q1 um, of the year. And of course, Q2 and Q4 for Bitcoin had those idiosyncratic risks and, and all of those event driven declines that occurred. But um, ultimately, in terms of the macro view, if you're going to kind of use, you know, an exogenous signal system, you're going to want to have a few different kind of checklist uh, boxes that you say, okay, well, has the NASDAQ bottom, has it shown signs of kind of changing momentum there? Is there an inflection point? Has high yield spreads, again, that we just talked about, have they kind of had an inflection point? Where is the VIX? Is the VIX kind of not making any new highs? Uh, is the VIX curve back in contango? And all those little small things, and you kind of put them all together and you can say, okay, well, at least on the macro standpoint, Bitcoin should be fine. And then in terms of the Bitcoin specific, you know, I really love the MVRV multiple. I think it makes so much sense to kind of compare the amount of, you know, on-chain cost basis, that average or the, or the total amount of fiat that essentially was stored by uh, the last price that it, it moved on chain, compare that against the market price. And you do have these extremes. You have, you know, the lows are, of course, naturally below that one and sometimes 0.85. All the way back in the day, you had a 0.55. Um, but then when you kind of consider that and you kind of put that together, okay, do we have the macro checklist? Do we have that on-chain valuation checklist? Okay, yes, MVRV is below one. Uh, you know, that, that in a combination of the two alongside an equity market that is showing momentum that, you know, investors are have risk appetite again. I think those are all kind of signs you could put together and say, okay, well, this could be a Bitcoin bottom. And I think that we are kind of in that environment now. Nice. Yeah, I, t I tend to agree. Um, I also want to get your thoughts on the yield curve inversion. A lot of people like look at this and say, oh, this means we're probably going to go into a recession at some point in the near future, you know, next 12 months or 24 months or something like that. And I think this has been like one of the most 
steep yield curve inversions so far. But I think a lot of your thoughts, and I think I agree with most of them, are it's, there's a decent probability that we actually do have like some sort of soft landing this time. How do you think about the yield curve inversion, and does that like kind of counter your perspective at all? Sure. So I think you know it's it's hard to argue against the the statistics of the yield curve inversion. And here's a joke that's been said. You know, it's forecasted ten of the last eight recessions, um, and so uh, ultimately, I think in this right now environment, because we have this supply side, primarily supply side. Uh, kind of inflation, this near term, of course, there's demand involved as well, but you have this near term inflation, but you've never had the secular tailwinds towards deflation like you've had, um, you know, every single year. And that and those are, of course, globalization, uh, robotics, um, algorithms, essentially the ability to cost cut. The technology is literally embedded into the society of, you know, not only just consumers, but in businesses and all of this stuff combined. You could even look at the cost of a genome, for example, right? And that's the classic example. Technology makes everything cheaper. Um, globalization, the internet, the flow of information makes uh, price shopping easier than ever. Uh, you have low interest rates historically. Of course, they're relatively high now. They're still historically low. Of course, that allows for debt, which is also deflationary. And so ultimately, you kind of can see and say, even through 10 years or longer of ZERP, there really wasn't price inflation, right? So there's this COVID pump of stimulus, uh, the wealth effect, plus all the supply chain problems because of the layoffs that occurred, create this near-term inflation. But ultimately, again, globalization, robotics, uh, price shopping, all of that stuff kind of keeps prices down in the long run. And that is why you're seeing such um, kind of an inverted yield curve. And so I um, think that's really just a function of, of course, the 10 year and the 20 year, those rates, you know, while again, historically elevated, they're still re relatively elevated, they're still historically low. And so it's just this kind of um, situation today that I think is forecasting something that may not necessarily be the case. Uh, because the soft landing, again, um, what would be a soft landing to me is, okay, inflation comes down towards the average. The labor market re remains resilient. Uh, the economy grows. It doesn't have to be accelerating. It doesn't have to be kind of shooting the lights out, but it really is growing and expanding and earnings are still relatively in line with expectations and they haven't really collapsed. And so really the labor market um, illustrates that a soft landing is certainly possible. A lot of people think a soft landing or a hard landing because they're looking at the price of kind of the stock market and they're saying, oh, well, the stock market's going down. It must be a hard landing. But it's been a very uncertain environment. And I think that ultimately uh, market participants will learn that there's a greater and greater probability of a soft landing and they may not be positioned for that um, kind of currently because bearish positioning is still there. Negative sentiment still remains, and ultimately, not many are still at that allocation that they want to be. Certainly not for crypto, uh, but I don't believe within equities either. Yeah, I definitely mostly agree. I think you made some pretty fantastic points there. Um, last macro topic, and then we can move on to more Bitcoin and, and crypto broadly. Um, I kind of have seen recently that M2 growth, I think, is even on a year-over-year -year basis, is negative, and I think this is one of like either the first time it's happened or the first time it's happened in a very, very long time. Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on, on that generally? So that's just a reflection of the global central bank tightening that's really occurred and, and, and the rate at which it, it, it's occurring. I mean, you had inflation that was, of course, the, fast, the highest it's been in 40 years. And so as a result, what did the Fed do? They hiked the fastest they have in 40 years. And so, of course, when you have financial tightening like that, uh, global M2 is going to come down. And another thing, you know, in terms of the bottom checklist that we were talking about earlier is um, M2 often rises over time. Uh, you know, money is created through debt, et cetera. Uh, quantitative easing, of course, there's periods of quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. We're in tightening right now. But ultimately, uh, central banks are very willing to print and very willing to provide stimulus uh, when it's needed. And so ultimately, of course, M2 growth being down and then you kind of show the chart of Bitcoin year over year and M2 year over year. And it's pretty much in line with each other. And it's like, well, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because Bitcoin is kind of a hedge against this monetary inflation, against the blowout of money supply, against the blowout of, of, of money in circulation, because it's, it's this hard coded asset. So when money supply does rise, incremental money does flow into Bitcoin. And so uh, certainly something on my radar, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of focus on the tightening that's occurring because it's been a, a, a tough tightening cycle. 
Um, if you kind of look where the market thought the Fed was going to be by the end of 2022 and the beginning of the year versus where they were, I mean, it was crazy. Uh, you know, and so ultimately it's been a tough year. But again, these are the longstanding principles that ultimately in 2023 and beyond people will remember again after we kind of get this 2022 uh, in the rearview mirror. Definitely. Yeah. Let's definitely talk about uh, uh, Bitcoin. And but before that, I do kind of want to get your thoughts on Ethereum. I'm personally not much of an Ethereum guy, as you may know from Twitter, but I do. I, I'm open to talking about it and discussing it. But of course, um, so I do want to know, like, how do you think about Ethereum? Like, do you think it's another form of money or how do you attempt to value something like ETH? Sure. So I think, uh, you know, Ethereum is is a very complementary asset to Bitcoin. It is certainly not a competitor uh, because ultimately it has a different goal. And really, Ethereum is this platform for decentralized applications. Right. And so we'll, we'll talk about Bitcoin in a little bit. But Bitcoin is this evolution of money. Uh, Ethereum is more like the evolution of the Internet. So you had Web 1, you have Web 2, and you could read, recreate, read, write, I'm sorry, and then recreate and own now. And so that really allows Ethereum to kind of be this attractive asset. And, and is it sound money? And I don't necessarily believe so. Um, I think it really, really relies on use of its underlying applications. Of course, that's within stable coins, digital art, infrastructure, DeFi. And so I think it's an attractive asset to own if you believe in decentralized applications, if you believe in the open internet uh, being free and how anyone with an internet connection, no matter their bank account, if they have one or not, can access DeFi. I think all of those sectors are really slowly disrupting the traditional ones. And one way to kind of gain exposure to that is just through owning Ether. Because every time someone utilizes DeFi on Ethereum, of course, anytime someone utilizes stable coin, NFTs, they want to buy an NFT, they need to buy Ether to do so. And so when you kind of invest in Ether, uh, think of it like a software, essentially, but ultimately you can capture all of the growth of that underlying crypto ecosystem. And that's very different than the internet. Because with the internet and with the World Wide Web, all of the value accrues to the applications built on it, right? Facebook, Instagram, Uber, all of those, all of the value accrues there. But with Ethereum, value is actually accruing to that protocol layer. And this is the first time where you even have an opportunity to invest in, in that protocol layer. You couldn't invest in HTTP, uh, but you can invest in Ethereum. And I think just based on that kind of opportunity set uh, and the potential and, and really the asymmetry that potentially investing in something that can be the next internet over the next 10, 20, 30 years offers makes it an attractive opportunity. Now, certainly not Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin has a ton of advantages in terms of the evolution of money, the store value, that medium of exchange. But Ethereum, if you want to own that Ether, you certainly can. And what I've recommended in the past is just the market cap weighted approach. Um, a lot of people kind of want to make it um, kind of competitive it doesn't need to be competitive one one might have more I think ETH probably has a little bit more near-term upside but the opportunity set that Bitcoin has is unmatched and so you don't want to get too excited about the flipping or anything of that nature you kind of want to just you know own both uh, of course everyone's gonna have their preference but I do like Ether as an asset for sure here's a quick message from our sponsor being involved in Bitcoin means you value freedom financial freedom freedom to save and freedom to spend Privacy, digital security, and no internet tracking logs are critical in the information age today. NordVPN is my favorite VPN service. It's fast, secure, and offers 5,500 secure servers in 59 countries. You can connect to any one of them and enjoy your favorite content no matter where you are. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, Threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. The best part about this sponsorship, there's literally no risk with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire situation never even happened. Check out our link, nordvpn.com blockware, to get your subscription started today. Yeah, let's definitely, uh, let's definitely talk about Bitcoin as well. Um, uh, what do you think about, we talked about this at the beginning. What do you think about Bitcoin's extreme volatility? Like, especially coming from the traditional finance world, I think you have a probably a unique perspective on this. Do you think it slows Bitcoin's adoption? Do you think it speeds it up as it, you mentioned, like it gets people's attention? Like, how do you think about Bitcoin's volatility? 
So in terms of adoption, I think Bitcoin's adoption is people adopt Bitcoin essentially for a variety of reasons. It also likely depends on where they are, where their home base is, their perspective of money to begin with. Um, but that's another conversation. But in terms of volatility, um, I think it's just really a function of this is an emerging speculative asset. It's only 14 years old and it's in the process of price discovery because people are still learning about it. Um, there's a lot of information asymmetry, a ton, right? Because you have this community that knows almost everything that they possibly can about Bitcoin. And then a large part of society that doesn't know anything about it, only things that they've read or heard. And so it, it provides this kind of up and down that often overshoots the true underlying value of it, right? And so, um, which is also why I do like that realized price. Um, but anyway, so the volatility itself is just a function of, it's just young. It's just, it's just young. And I think over time, as more and more institutional investors start to invest in Bitcoin, uh, they'll start to have these kind of automated rebalancing. More investors will start to like uh, kind of those dips. I think that ultimately the 80% drawdowns uh, will turn to 50. Those 50% drawdowns over time will likely be smaller and smaller as the asset matures, as more people are involved in it. And really it becomes that mature um, you know, asset that uh, most people now have an understanding and, and actually own as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you buy into the idea of like some people talk about, okay, maybe like a, a comp for Bitcoin is like the gold market where if Bitcoin becomes gold 2.0, Bitcoin is a $10 trillion asset, which is roughly, you know, half a million dollars per coin. Do you buy into that comparative or do you think that that's maybe like misaligned or not correct? I think it's a, I think it's an easy comparative just in terms of the mental side of things and the psychological side of things. And it's like, okay, well, you have gold with the successful store of value. And one of the things I point out all the time is that gold went through a 70% drawdown in its past. It went through a 45% drawdown from 2011, 2015. So gold was very volatile and it's still adopted as a store of value because over time it's become less and less and less volatile. Um, so I think comparing Bitcoin to a digital gold makes sense. I do think Bitcoin as a medium of exchange makes a lot of sense, but depending on your home base. So United States people have the fortune and the benefit of a very strong and likely the best fiat currency um, in the world. And so you have less propensity to substitute your existing medium of exchange. I'm going to go buy a coffee. I'm going to do it with dollars. Um, because it's kind of a censorship resistant medium of exchange where you can't have a bank or a government tell you that, hey, you can't send money to this person. You can do it no matter what. So it kind of gives you like peace of mind that, hey, I have this asset that I may be worth a lot of money even at today's dollars and I can broadcast it to anyone in the world pretty much for, for not for free, but for very low cost. It's pretty, pretty interesting. It's incredible. Bitcoin has the largest addressable market of any asset that I can think of. It's, it's literally everybody. Um, and it, it's other countries, you know, you, you can't just invest in Apple stock, right? You know, if you don't have the banking infrastructure, if you don't have um, a brokerage account, you don't have that infrastructure to the stock exchange, uh, you can't do that. But with Bitcoin, literally all you need is an internet connection. And that just makes it such an attractive option. And a lot of people get stuck on, well, is it a medium of exchange or is it a store of value? It's, a, it's both. It's, it's kind of whatever you want it to be. And that's why it's so attractive. And that's what you said, the censorship resistant. That's what makes Bitcoin money, whereas Ethereum is more uh, a platform for decentralized applications, almost like a software, because as we've seen recently, it's not that censorship resistant, whereas Bitcoin, this proof of work uh, certainly is. And, and that's what's really attractive about Bitcoin. Yeah, definitely. I want to dive a little bit deeper into like Bitcoin adoption cycles. I know we talked a lot about, you know, from a macro perspective, how whenever, I guess, generally speaking, the money printer, quote unquote, whether that's physical or monetary stimulus comes back on, that's obviously pretty bullish. What do you think of, of that combined with halvings, election cycles, uh, on-chain data? Like what, what is like the, is it all of these combined, like equally that, that leads to these massive parabolic bull runs, or is there maybe like the having, or is it the monetary stimulus that, that is a, more of a major contributor to Bitcoin's massive parabolic bull runs? Like which one gives more weight or, or do you weigh them all equally? Yeah. So I think, you know, there's these underlying secular trends that essentially drive Bitcoin adoption. Um, and, and of course those are, you know, money is evolving, uh, no matter what we say, it really started as barter and then it moved to commodities and livestock, paper money, gold money, gold, and then back to paper. 
Um, and every one of those uh, was fueled by a technological advancement, uh, whether that was the printing press or millage um, or transportation even back in the day. All, every technological advancement allowed for a better form of money. And, and so you have this digitalization of money that's occurring no matter what we say. People are utilizing Apple Pay. They're utilizing Venmo more often than anything and, and PayPal, et cetera. So you have this digitalization of money that's already occurring. You have everybody that has a smartphone now everybody's connected to the internet. So you have digitalization of money, you have technology, and then you have changing investor preferences. You know, back in the day, 10 decades or a decade, 10, 20 years ago, you had, um, you know, people really focused on dividends and income with what you're investing in. And now people are really interested in innovation. And so when you kind of consider it as an investment, that kind of change of, of kind of perception or investor interest certainly benefits Bitcoin as well. Populism, uh, people are losing uh, you know, losing trust in institutions uh, across the board and, and, and as well as emerging markets that are emerging and emerging. And so you have these secular trends. And I think that those are this underlying invisible hand that's just pushing more and more people towards Bitcoin, this new asset that has, of course, all of the qualities of sound money plus unique qualities on top of that that make it particularly attractive, decentralization, hard-coded scarcity, uh, transparency. So you have that kind of underlying invisible hand and then you have these macro events that kind of accelerate adoption so those are kind of the unprecedented monetary policy decades of low interest rates kind of pushing uh, investors further out on the risk curve the parabolic advance to twenty thousand was an awareness moment the advance to sixty seven thousand was an awareness moment and even this bear market was also an awareness moment because still you would go on cnbc bloomberg all of these financial news outlets and, and mainstream news outlets, and it's being talked about every hour. It, it, this is an asset where uh, used to face a lot of scrutiny, um, a lot of controversy, and even amidst a 70% drawdown is now being talked about on CNBC constantly. And so it is really becoming mainstream really quickly, which makes it really interesting to see what the latter half of the 2020s looks like, right? When we get to that 2030 year that a lot of people talk about, we'll have two more halvings um, since then, until then, I mean. And so that makes it really attractive. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that was well said. I mean, it's, I liked what, how you said like Bitcoin is kind of, uh, it's, it's everywhere at this point. I mean, it's on like, the Wall Street Journal front page, you have like the S&P 500 NASDAQ, and then if you scroll to the right, there's Bitcoin, and it's there every single day, um, which is just kind of mind-blowing, and it's interesting how like Bitcoin, with like no marketing team, no like known founder, like it just went from nothing to a multi-hundred billion dollar asset, and everyone can't stop thinking about it, or at least talking about it, or at least hearing about it. It's kind of crazy. It's it's crazy, and and it has this brand, and it has this goodwill essentially with it. And, and you know, you, you hear these questions: Oh, what if something comes that's better? Can Bitcoin be dethroned? And it's like, well, first of all, Bitcoin has made significant network effect strides, but ultimately, it has that brand that is very hard to take away. It's it's Bitcoin, right? So aside from the technology itself, it has that network effect. It has that lingo. And what's really interesting is that. Right now, it's 14 years old. So a lot of people in this world, you know, were born and grew up without Bitcoin. But as we get, you know, longer and longer every year and every year, the younger generation is just going to know about Bitcoin from their youngest years. And that makes it even more attractive in 20 to 30 years when you have people that aren't even born yet know about Bitcoin and really uh, kind of view it as this, this real asset. Whereas right now, it's this controversial asset that is, is becoming a macro position within you know, strategic asset allocations or consumers are owning it. Uh, investors are, you know, kind of trading it or owning it as well. But it's really still just emerging and we're getting right there to this another acceleration phase. And I think the next bull market would be the one um, because you had that bear market in 2018, 2019 that a lot of people lost confidence when we kind of surpassed that 20,000 in 2020. Um, regain confidence, but now you have another 70% drawdown. So this time around, um, people are going to be like, wow, you know, Bitcoin came back again. I think I should own some of it. And, and I think that um, is going to be a big kicker too. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, it's fascinating how Bitcoin is this asset that unlike a lot of other assets, like once they go down, you know, 80 something percent, they don't, may not necessarily ever come back up, but Bitcoin is the one asset that keeps doing it over and over again, which is truly fascinating. I like what you brought up about how it's kind of somewhat of like a 
demographic shift of people that like hold Bitcoin. Like I think of maybe like older people, like 70 plus that may not also may not really understand technology, may not be like super deep into uh, even like history of money, obviously as well. Like they have such a hard time grasping something like Bitcoin. But when you talk to someone that's like in high school or college or just graduated college, they're like intuitively understand like this idea of a digital asset, even if they don't even necessarily like understand like what the Bitcoin blockchain is. Exactly. And that is a function of exactly what you said. Just it's digital nature. It's just digitally native. And <laughs> these kids now have iPads in their hands so young. I mean, I didn't, I don't think I had my first cell phone until I was in high school. Right. And it's just like people have smartphones now early on. And so they're just so deep embedded into the internet and, and, and networks in general and, and social media and all of this stuff that exactly what you said, it's just this demographic shift that, and you see all the surveys as well. You ask the millennial generation, are you interested in owning gold or Bitcoin? And, and it's almost always Bitcoin. It's because the millennial generation, specifically the younger ones and the Gen Zs or Gen X, right? Whatever the next one is, um, they have really long time horizons and gold is great, but you can't bring it everywhere you go. Um, it's not that cool to have, you know, it's good. It's cool on your jewelry. It, it, it has value because it creates jewelry. But you don't just go around saying, oh, I have an ounce of gold. But now you say, oh, I have a Bitcoin. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. So, um, you know, it, it is just this digital asset. It's just not connected to any government, uh, central entity or organization. It's it, it just again, it just fits within this this intersection of just money that is evolving no matter what. And this new demographic that is very interested in assets, plus a reason to invest because it's fully decentralized, it's fully transparent, and it's hard coded, which in today's society, when you look all about global central banks, you look at the Fed's balance sheet, look at the ECB's balance sheet, all of this, hard coded scarcity is just not a thing. It, this is verifiably scarce, which you always say all the time. Um, and it's it's awesome. And, and, and I don't think people have really understood that yet, is that this asset, there will never be more than 21 million. It comes on a schedule right? Every 10 minutes, new Bitcoin is created, but that's it. There's not one person that doesn't matter who's, who elects them. It's not one person that can change it. Uh, and then you kind of see what's going on with the monetary policy and the Fed. And, and, and I like the Fed. I, I think the Fed, you know, they, they're in a tough spot to begin with in general. They do as best as they can. What the best they can do is not great because it's a tough environment. You cannot manage an economy, a group of people. It's just very hard to do. Um, but they've supported Bitcoin adoption through all the quantitative easing, through all of the stuff that's going on, it's like, okay, well, 40% of US dollars in circulation were printed post COVID. Like, that's crazy. So every dollar that you have in your savings account, you're not receiving any interest on that to begin with, you're diluted. And then of course, you saw it actually ultimately lead to price inflation. So yeah, great points. Um, I do have another question that's kind of different, and you may not have too many thoughts on it. Um, there's like a lot of talks about like, is the having priced in? And this was like a popular conversation back in like 2019 before the 2020 having, and now we're coming up on like the 2024 having, and like, you know, a lot of people say, well, markets are efficient. Of course it's priced in. Some people say, oh, markets, Bitcoin is kind of an example that markets may not be super efficient or as efficient as we thought. And that's why Bitcoin just rallies a bunch after these havings. Where do you stand on that? Like are markets efficient and like is the 2024 having priced in? Yeah, so I, I think Bitcoin markets are not efficient. I think there's just so much information asymmetry versus the people that understand Bitcoin versus the b broad majority of people that don't own Bitcoin still. So there's always that in information asymmetry. I think that the halvings, of course, inherently increase scarcity. Although I do think that in this environment, the, the situation with miners and kind of the concerns around there, when if you do kind of take that block reward, you put it in half, it's just interesting to see if that does have any negative uh, impact because you do have that long-term uh, kind of uncertainty whether, you know, what happens in 10, 20, 30 halvings from here. I don't think that's necessarily an issue. Um, but I do think that markets should, or Bitcoin should rally into that halving because it is less inherent selling pressure. Um, there is less price movement that needs to go up to keep that same market cap. So I think naturally it's priced in. And what you see is you, you see that rally that normally begins. And I, and I want to say off the top of my head about 500 days before the halving. And, and it's normally this bottom. And if you kind of chart, uh, you know, the, the day one post halving to the halving, you can kind of see that there's this inflection point. Often Bitcoin kind of rallies after the halving 
has this mid cycle pullback and then rallies in anticipation of the next one. Um, and I think that when the economic environment just improves and people feel a little bit better about adding risk, uh, risk, risk appetite kind of grows. I think that that having narrative should pick up again. And, 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 and again, it's just because that there's less inherent selling pressure in that. And, and it just, again, illustrates that it is verifiably scarce on the day on that block number. It's going to reduce the block award in half. That is exactly how Bitcoin's disinflation happens. And there you go. And then what happens in another four years, the same thing around four years, of course, around the next four years, same exact thing. So people need to understand how that disinflation actually happens. It's through the halving. Totally. Last question, then uh, we can wrap it up for maybe like an, an older investor that can't get over the, the hurdle that, hey, Bitcoin is this asset that doesn't produce any free cash flows, right? Like if you're never going to get a dividend off of holding Bitcoin in, in something like cold storage. Um, maybe you can do other things with your Bitcoin, potentially lending it out in the future. Obviously, it's been proven pretty risky to do that in the past. So maybe don't do it quite yet or maybe find a good counterparty if you ever consider doing something like that. But inherently, Bitcoin itself has zero cash flow. How do you explain that to like more of a traditional finance type that has a struggle of like, OK, why would I ever hold this then? Yeah, so not every asset is going to provide at least dividend income in, in a portfolio. Right. And so. Uh, particularly kind of that high beta or that long duration tech that, you know, more and more people own uh, growth and technology in general is being held by more and more investors. Um, and so ultimately that part of their portfolio, of course, those assets have free cash flow or some of them do and not many in the NASDAQ do actually. Um, but ultimately people are investing in this longer duration innovation. And I think that's just what you kind of have to consider again is just if you are worried um, about Bitcoin's volatility, then then you just right size your positions, right? Have a smaller position size that you're not freaking out if Bitcoin goes down 10%. Actually, you get excited when it goes down because then you could rebalance or then you can kind of dollar cost average. Um, so uh, in terms of investors that are just hesitant in general, I think it's just kind of zooming back out and understanding and just again, pitching the idea that again, money is evolving. You know, no matter what we say, money is evolving and Bitcoin has these really attractive characteristics that give it a fighting chance to be the next you know, form of money. And so that kind of opportunity, if you right size your positions, don't go all in, don't mortgage your house for Bitcoin, right? If you have a portfolio, an investment portfolio, it makes sense to have a low single digit at least in, in Bitcoin, right? Because again, it's a long duration asset. A lot of things can occur. A lot of adoption can occur over the next 20 years. Again, just as we talked about the secular drivers, but really those macro events that accelerate adoption, uh, certainly worth owning in your portfolio, despite that free cash flow, um, a concern again, and even the volatility, just right size your positions and, and buy the dip uh, and, and, and be careful because which is what we saw, Bitcoin erased five months of, of losses in two weeks. And so that is incredible. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think you made some great points. Like Bitcoin and leverage are things that don't really mix very well, obviously. And yeah, if you take a large allocation of your portfolio to something like Bitcoin and like you don't fully understand it or you don't expect a lot of future volatility, you're probably going to either get wrecked or you're going to end up selling after it falls 50%. So yeah, I totally agree. Like if you don't feel comfortable with it or you don't understand it, you should take a smaller position size. But if, I think if you do, once you do understand it, which could take a long time, then yeah, like allocate a ton of, a ton of your portfolio to it if, if you think that that's the future, which I, I personally do. <laughs> but no, I think this is a super good conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. Um, where do you want to send the audience after this? Keep a lookout for my uh, Substack. I'm um, coming out with some research and uh, I'll be doing some bespoke model portfolios as well as kind of continuing to provide that investment strategy and the research that I often discuss too, throughout, my, throughout my time. Awesome. Also, what's, what's your Twitter handle? I forgot. Yeah. Go I know to, it's, uh, post some great stuff there. I think it's Joe Orsini underscore. Um, you know, I tweet pretty often and talk about Bitcoin price action all the time. Keep the Maddox. Uh, and so, yeah, of course, come there and keep a lookout for my new Substack.